You know, maybe you've seen, I've seen videos, YouTube videos of cameras that have been dropped from space accidentally. Um, maybe it wasn't accidentally. It might have been part of an advertising campaign for maybe one of those uh, you go things. What do they call those? What is it? Yeah, GoPro, that's it. So they dropped one, I think, from like 30 miles up, and it spun around all the way down and, and videotaped. It's like pretty dull because why? Well, because, because it's not pointed at anything. It's not directed towards anything. Like it's a perfectly objective portrait of reality that's absolutely pointless, right? Because there's, there's no, there, nothing is zeroing in on anything. You know, and you, even to organize your damn vision, even to focus your eyes, you have to have a value hierarchy because you have to be focusing on something that you think is important. And if you think it's important, it has to be more important than other things. In fact, it has to be more important than everything else at that moment because otherwise you wouldn't be focusing on it. And so there's no getting rid of hierarchies. Not, not unless you want to dysregulate your perceptual structures entirely and sacrifice your emotional stability, no more positive emotion, plenty of confusion though, and be immobilized. And then also sit there and do nothing and suffer and die. And so let the, the idea that there's something intrinsically wrong with hierarchies, that's, it's wrong. <laughs> it's wrong. It's really deeply wrong. It's deeply and stupidly wrong at, at multiple levels. And, and so then the question becomes more um, appropriately, well, what should the hierarchy be? And not whether or not there should be one. It's like, and, and you know, it's not like I'm not cognizant of the negative consequences of hierarchies. It's, it's not like they're all positive. You know, I mean, no matter what hierarchy we set up to pursue what goal, it, do, it doesn't matter what the goal is, some people turn out to be better at doing that, and some people turn out to be worse. And the people... <clears throat> who turn out to be worse, pay a fairly heavy price for being worse. And so you set up a hierarchy, there are people, and more people at the bottom that are worse, pay a fairly heavy price. And so it's, it's not like hierarchies are, are without cost. And I, and I would say to the degree that the left end of the political spectrum has a valid point, their valid point is um, Pay some attention to the people at the bottom of the hierarchies because it's a rough place to be. And keep the hierarchies fair so that people can move up. And keep them focused on their tasks so they're doing useful things and aren't corrupted by people who are only seeking power. All of that. Fine. No hierarchy? That's a bad idea. That's a non-starter. Okay, so now you're deciding to go somewhere. And it, 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 it doesn't matter where it is small scale journey or large scale journey because a large scale journey is composed of a multitude of small scale journeys so I'll, 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 give, I'll give you an example of this I'm gonna build up a moral hierarchy for you from from the bottom okay and, and here, here's one of the things that's kind of cool about doing this because it actually solves to some degree the mind-body problem if you do that. And so if you're sitting there thinking, geez, I wish that I could solve the mind-body problem tonight, then, you know, maybe tonight's your lucky night because maybe that's what's going to happen. So um, imagine, that, uh, imagine that you're going to uh, do something like prepare dinner. You might think that's a good thing. So, that's interesting. So, it's an action, but we'd also put a moral dimension on it. It's good to feed hungry people, yourself included. Maybe you do a good job of making dinner. That'd even be better. Not only are you making dinner, <clears throat> but you're making a good dinner. And so, that, that makes making dinner an even more impressive moral feat, because you could make some wretched, cold, dismal, massive, glutinous, catastrophe and serve it with contempt and hatred to the people that, that are around you, you know? You could do that, and it would still be dinner, but, you know, it'd be, it'd be a low quality. It'd be a low quality and, and all too common occurrence. Um, but let's say that you, you do it right, you know? It's like, you're going to put some effort into it. It's going to be delicious. That'd be nice. It's going to be nutritious. It's going to be attractive. Um, and it's going to be served with the proper attitude. 
You know, you're happy that you have some food. That's kind of nice. It hasn't been all that long that everybody had food. And certainly it hasn't been all that long that everybody had a vast variety of high-quality food. And so a little gratitude would be nice. And so, so you got your... So, so even... So, so back, to the, back to the task at hand. You're, you're going to make dinner. So the question is, well, what exactly do you do to make dinner? And it's kind of an abstract idea to make dinner. Let's go make dinner. You can say that abstractly, but when you actually go to make dinner, it's not abstract anymore. You go into the kitchen, and you open the refrigerator, and that, that's not abstract, right? That's not mental. It's physical. You're interacting with the world. You grab the door handle on the refrigerator, and you open it. And you don't really know how you do that. You know, I mean, I know you know how to close your hand and move your arm, but you don't know how you know how to close your hand and open the door. Your, your mind, that's where your mind runs out. It knows how to operate your voluntary musculature, but it doesn't know how. So your mind grounds out in your body. And, 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 and I'm going to make the case that morality does that as well. And it's part of this idea that the world is an action-oriented place. You open the fridge, you think, hey, carrots! We're going to need some carrots. So you take the bag of carrots out of the fridge and you put them on the counter and you peel the carrots. And again, same thing. Bit of expert behavior there, you know, because you've peeled carrots before. And it's a bit deterministic because you've learned how to do it habitually. And so you peel the carrots and you take out the parts that aren't so edible, if you have any sense. And then you take out your knife and maybe you have a nice knife with a nice wide blade at the end so you can chop up carrots. It's kind of fun to do that if you're good at it because you can, you know, make a hundred slices in... 20 or 30 seconds if you've practiced it, and you take your carrot and you go, and then you have all these, you don't have to make that noise, by the way, but, but, but you can if you want, and then if, if you're good at it, then all the carrots are pretty much the same thickness, and that's kind of cool. You got a little expertise there, and you got all the carrots lined up, and maybe then you put them in some foil, and you add a little butter, and some, I don't know, cumin, and a bit of pepper, and make them into a foil packet. This is what we do in Canada. You might do that. You guys barbecue, I've heard. And then you throw the things on the barbecue and, and you wait till their steam puffs up the, the foil and you think, done. And if you have any sense at the same time, you know, you're cooking the steak and it's done at the same time and the potatoes, and it's all done at the same time and it's caramelized nicely so it's got a bit of sweetness and, you know, you've got the right amount of butter for the potatoes and you serve it and, and, and that's, that's good. That's good. And, and it took you a long time to learn that. And, it, and there's a hierarchy there. Eh? So the hierarchy is, the lowest part of the hierarchy is the muscular movements, say, that you, you employ when you're slicing up the carrots. There's nothing abstract about that. And then there's the, the sequencing of the carrots in the foil and the placing them on the, on the, uh, on the grill and all of that. And that's, that's where the, the, the rubber hits the road. And you think, well, hey, I made a good dinner. And then you might think, well, what's making a good dinner a subset of? You might think, well, you know, if you're a good friend, good parent, <clears throat> maybe one of the things that you could do is make a good dinner. Like, it's not the only thing. It, that, that, I make a good dinner, and so I'm a good friend. It's like, no. Maybe that's one-fifth of it, or a tenth of it. It's, it's some non-trivial proportion of it. Necessary, but not sufficient. Is that right? No. No, that's not right. It's not necessary. Um, anyways, it's one of the things you could do to be a good friend. And then, you know, if you have a friend, maybe he makes you a good dinner now and then, and there's some reciprocity there. So that's, and so you're capable of engaging in that reciprocity. And that's another thing that might make you a good friend. And, and, or a good parent, let's say. So let's say there's ten things like that, at that level, that make you a good parent. It's like, well, what? Um, you can make a good meal. You can, uh, you can clean up the kitchen. That's a good thing to be able to do. You can clean up the bathroom um, and, the, and, and the rest of the house. Um, so there's maybe five. You know how to clean. Well, that's part two of being a good parent. Um, you, you get along with your partner. You, you know how to negotiate with them. And, and some of the things you negotiate about are those lower level tasks that you're going to engage in. It's like, well, I made dinner, maybe you could clean up the kitchen. And, you know, there'd be some reciprocity there. And if you're a good person, which is getting a little higher up in the value hierarchy, then you can engage in that kind of negotiation. So, but, and, and that is exactly what you would be engaged 
negotiating is those tasks. And so, well, so maybe you're the sort of partner that can communicate with your partner. And maybe you're the sort of parent that can bring their children into the kitchen and teach them the mechanical elements of food preparation, starting at the bottom, right? I mean, maybe you're not going to give them the sharp knife to begin with, but you might get them to set the table. It's like they're two and a half. It's like the table needs to be set. Here's a spoon, kid. Take the spoon. A kid can do that. He knows what a spoon is. You don't say, um, set the table for a dinner party of 20 to a two and a half year old, right? Because they haven't got that level of abstraction mastered. You say, you see this? Yes. Pat, pat. Here's a spoon. Yes. C can you say spoon? Spoon. Good. Good. Take the spoon. Take it. Good. G you know where the table is? Yes. How about if you go put the spoon on the table? It's like, yeah, I can do that. So the kid wanders over and puts the spoon on the table and, and then maybe comes back and looks at you. And they look at you to think is, well, did I get the spoon on the table right? Did I, did I do it right? That's one thing. Did I undertake the action correctly? That's one thing. And was it a good action, right? Did I do something that was morally appropriate? They're trying to check both of those out at the same time. And you pat them on the head and you say, hey, good job, man. You're, you're growing up. And by that, you also signify to them that growing up is a good thing. And that's also important. And then you say, well, here's another spoon. You're going to encounter lots of spoons in your life. Why don't you go put it on the table too? <laughs> and so, you know, they put the spoons on the table and then maybe you show them how the spoons might be arranged and then maybe you trust them with a fork and then, then they can do the same thing and then with the knife and, you know, a dull butter knife sort of thing, at least to begin with, and, and with, the, with, the, with, the, with the dishes. And you teach them bottom up, right? Reflex upward. You teach them the mechanics of preparing something complex. And so they, they have all those micro skills embedded in them, so to speak. Now they're, they're part of their, their psychophysiological ability. And at some point, with a certain amount of training, might take three months, four months, six months, you can say, set the table. And then the kid knows exactly what to do. And they don't know what to do until they have all those micro routines mastered. And so that's kind of cool, because what it indicates is that the the, the command, the, the macro command, set the table, is only something that has a meaning when the micro processes that are motoric have already been mastered. And, and that's a really good way of thinking about how you're constituted. Like you have a lot of skills, things you can do with your body. Act, act, action oriented skills and perceptual skills. And once you have them as part of you, then other people can refer to them and you understand each other. And that's partly how we understand each other, is that we share a hierarchy of skill and perception that's built from the bottom up to a very high level of abstraction and also a very high level of isomorphism, meaning it's the same for everyone. So, so, so okay, I'll, I'll explain that momentarily here. So, now, We already established that you have to do things. And I, I'm going to elaborate on that claim a little bit. So, you have to do things. Um, and you have emotional systems that help you decide whether you're on the right path. Because if you have to do things, you're on a path. And if you're going somewhere, you better be on the right path. And so then you need something to tell you whether or not you're on the right path. And that's what your emotions do. Your positive emotion and your negative emotion. They're orienting systems that tell you whether you're on the right path. And the path is defined by the goal. So you need a goal. So that's the first thing to think about. It's really, 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 really important to think about this. If your life is not the way you want it to be, it's possible that your goal is not what it should be. And that that's a fundamental religious teaching, by the way. I, I would say that might be the fundamental religious teaching of Buddhism. Right? Because the Buddhists teach in some sense that everything is maya or illusion. And, and it's a complicated idea. But partly what it means is the way the world manifests itself to you is in large part determined by your aim within the world. And so by switching aim, you can switch whether something is 
positive or negative. Like, let's say you come home and you're, you find your wife's having an affair. It's like, man, you're, you're not happy. You're one bitter, twisted, angry person. And, you know, you go down to the bar and you have a few drinks and you thought, God, you know, I really never liked her. And you think, hey, this is the best day of my life. My wife had an affair. It's like, I'm free. I know, I know this is a ridiculous story, but you get my point, you know. It's like, you, you could make a switch like that. And you think, well, isn't it so strange? It's like half an hour ago, I was like bitter and twisted and angry and resentful and anxious and, and frustrated and disappointed because there was something I wanted and I wasn't getting it. And now all of a sudden, I've decided I didn't want that and everything is switched around. And so that's... That's a, that's a kind of a, that's a miracle that that can happen. And so in rule six, you know, I, 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 the rule is um, put your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Well, so what's the idea? It's like, well, if the world isn't up to your standards, let's say, first of all, you might ask yourself about that to begin with. It's like, the world isn't up to your standards. Really. That's... And, and that's the world's problem somehow. It, it's, it's not more likely that it's given that you're talking about the world here. It's, it's not more likely that there's some chance that it's your problem. And that if you put yourself right, then the world wouldn't appear to be a problem. And I mean, it, it's a profound question, you know, and, I, and I'm not throwing that out cynically or sarcastically. I mean, I've been disenchanted with the world a fair number of times personally. I'm including myself in, in the list of people who make that error, but, you know, knowing that your emotional reactions are dependent on your aim, and that that's actually technically true, does immediately open up the question, hey man, if things aren't laying themselves in front of you, out in front of you, the way that is necessary for you to live a full and engaged life and not be cynical and bitter and twisted and cruel and vengeful and, and disappointed and all of that. It's just possible that you're not aiming at the right thing. And man, that is a question. That is a question worth asking. Well, it's the question people do ask. It's like, well, what's the purpose of life? Well, it's the same question. What should I aim at? Those are the same questions. And, you know, if, if what you're aiming at is producing nothing but unrequited misery for you and everyone else, and it's a downhill bloody spiral into something approximating hell, then there is some possibility that you should think that perhaps your aim is off. So, and, and I, I don't want to overplay my hand on that either, too, because I know perfectly well that, you know, people... If you're suffering, if you're depressed, if you're miserable, there might, you might be, you might just, it might be a consequence of really bad luck. You know, like, people get sick. And good people get sick, right? Everyone knows that. You know, good people, they get sick and they die. And so you can't say, well, if you're miserable and sick, it's because there's something, you know, bad about you. Because then that would be the case for everyone, Always, whenever they get ill, and you could just blame ill people. It's like, well, it serves you right that you're sick because you're a bad person. It happens a lot, actually, with ill people, you know, and it's an unfortunate thing. So I know there's an element of chance to all this. And I, and I don't want to downplay that. You know, we are dust in the wind, to use a terrible cliche from a 70s rock song. Um, we're blowing hither and thither by events that are somewhat beyond our control. But that's still not the point. The point is that to a large degree, you can determine the manner in which the world manifests itself to you by changing your aim. And so then that opens up. That opens up the entire domain of philosophy. You think, what good is philosophy? And people think that all the time. What good is philosophy? It's like, hey, philosophy is about value. Well, what use is value? Well, value determines your aim. Well, who cares what your aim is? Well, your aim determines the manner in which the world lays itself out to you emotionally. Well, who cares about that? No one says that. The argument stops there because no one, especially no one who's been seriously hurt or seriously depressed, like in pain, no one ever says, oh, well, who cares about that? Because if you can say that about your pain, all that means is you actually haven't been in pain. Because if you're in enough pain, you will not say that, that's for sure. So, you need to know what to aim at. So, now you aim at something, you've got a goal, and then you see that you're making progress towards the goal. That's a good thing. That makes you happy. It actually, technically, 
There's a system, dopamine system, neurochemical system. Same system, by the way, that cocaine and methamphetamine and, and opiates activate, which is why people like to take those drugs. And it tells you that you're, you're moving forward in the manner that you should be according to the dictates of your plan. Doesn't necessarily tell you whether you have a good plan. That, that's a more complicated problem. Because who knows if you have a good plan. But, but one thing that you could know is that a plan is better than no plan. That's a really useful thing to know, especially if you're kind of drifting. It's like, well, I'm going to find myself. It's like, no, just pick something and, and move towards it. And as you move towards it, you're going to succeed and fail specifically. And then you're going to learn something about success specifically, and you're going to learn something about failure specifically, and then you can learn what you use to fix your plan. So, so a stupid plan is way better than no plan, and you're likely to have a stupid plan, or at least to be able to make one, so that's good news for everybody. You can make a stupid plan, and so I would say, make a stupid plan. And then implement it. Not any stupider than it has to be. You know, you could think about it a little bit. But then implement it. And have your successes and failures along the way. And learn from them. And then you can, rig, you can rejig the goal. You can move the target. That, that's fine. That's, that's, that's part of the game. It doesn't have to be fixed. It's a movable target. And maybe what you're trying to do is to move the target to an ever better place. So, so you're moving towards a target. And at the same time, you're moving the target. Right. And... And, and you're trying to move the target towards something like an ultimate ideal. You're trying to find out what that ultimate ideal is. And part of the way you figure that out is by moving towards a target and by learning about success and failure along the way. Because then you can inform yourself with regards to what might constitute a reasonable aim. And so that's the reason to go out in the world and like, make some mistakes, you know? And then you're going to. And so it's okay. It's okay to make the mistakes. It's not so okay not to learn from them. Because then you make the mistakes again. That seems pointless. And so you're moving towards wherever you're going. And it's working. And so you get some positive emotion. You get some motivation from this dopaminergic system that adds zest to life. It, it adds interest and engagement and meaning to life. It pulls you into life. And so and that's worth thinking about, I would say. Because if you think about it, you know, you have might wonder about whether or not you should be engaged in life. And then, if all of a sudden you're doing something, and because you're doing it, you get engaged in life, then it seems like that might be the very definition of a good thing. It's evidence. The engagement is evidence that you're actually doing a good thing, a worthwhile thing in life, with all its suffering and misery and brutality. It's like, you've got a pathway, you've got an aim, you're moving forward, you're engaged. Excellent. Your nervous system, very deep down, this dopaminergic system. It's, a, it's associated with a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. It's a really, really old part of the brain. It's not some new thing that popped up like 15,000 years ago. It's ancient. It's there to orient you in the world. It's, it's part of the instinct for meaning that I talked about in chapter, I think it's chapter 7, do what is meaningful and not what is expedient. It's a deep, deep instinct. And way down, in, way down in your psychophysiological structure. Not as far down as the serotonin system, but like next level up. And so if it's saying, hey man, you're on the right track, it's like, that's worth noticing. It's worth noticing. Now you can criticize it out of existence. You can question your, your aim continually. It's, it's one of the, what would you call it, dangers of our capacity to abstract. But you know, if you're a smart person who doubts, you also might be smart enough now and then to doubt your doubt and just to notice and to pay attention. And it's something I explain to my clinical clients and my students often. It's like, if you're trying to put your life together, watch yourself for a couple of weeks. Like you don't know who you are. Because if your life isn't together, you don't know who you are. So just watch yourself like you don't know who you are. And notice now and then if you're engaged in something. You know, and you kind of have to wake up because if you're engaged in it, you don't quite notice, right? Because you're engaged in it. But afterwards, you might think, oh, I just spent an hour, and I didn't notice that it was an hour. I was in it. That's good. You're in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. There's something about that that's right. And maybe, like, you're not in good shape, and that happened to you, like, 15 minutes once in two weeks. It's like, that's pretty dismal. And the rest of the time, it was wretched. It's like, okay, fine. Well, maybe in the next two weeks, you see if you can do it for half an hour. 
and then maybe for 45 minutes, and then maybe for an hour, right? You can start practicing being in that place. That's a very useful thing to learn. It's like, oh, look, I'm interested in what I'm doing. I'm engaged in it. Now, how did I get here? Where am I exactly? And how did I get here? And how could I stay here? How could I be here more often? Those are all questions you have to ask yourself. Well, that's the beginning of philosophy as well. And you think, well, why bother? And the answer is, well, do you, you want to be engaged in your life? Well, why would you? Well, it's positive. It's analgesic. It fights off pain. It quells anxiety. It gives you purpose. It's good for you, practically speaking. Generally speaking, if you have an aim and you're moving forward, you're moving forward to something that's psychologically valuable, but also practically valuable. If it's really a good aim, also it's good for you now, tomorrow, the next day, the next month, because you're smart enough to, generally smart enough, to calibrate yourself so that things that are really bad for you don't have that engaging quality. Now, it's, it's not perfect, especially if you've messed yourself up psychologically by lying to yourself in all sorts of different ways. But it's still not a bad orienting system. And then the other thing you can also notice is, well, when are you doing things that make you feel really awful? By your own standards. It's like, oh, look, I just did something. I had some interaction with someone, and now I feel awful. It's like, well, maybe you could not do that, whatever it was. You might have to think it through. What were the routines that constituted that ill-advised set of actions? And maybe you're going to have to think really deeply about it, you know, because God only knows how much of your personality structure is involved in that error. But if it made you wretched, it made you feel like life wasn't worth living, then that might be a hint that that wasn't a good thing to do. And so then maybe you could start doing more of the things that make you engaged and less of the things that make you hate life. And that's worthy, that's worthy of practice, let's say. You might think about that as a, a, it's a fundamental ethical requirement, or I would say it's a fundamental form of religious meditation. That's a better way of thinking about it. And so then you're on the path. That's the straight and narrow path. It's like, I'm moving forward. I've got an aim. I'm moving forward. As I move forward, I'm engaged. It's bloody well worth walking down this pathway. And, you know, on the left of me is terror and horror and hell and pain, and I'm avoiding that. And to the right of me, perhaps, is ego and arrogance and the things that can get out of control with regards to positive emotion. But I've got that balance right. I'm on the right pathway. Okay, and now we think about what might constitute the right pathway. Well, um, I can tell you a pathway that, that works for me, to some degree. So this is a value structure that's characteristic of me, um, of, of things I do. I type, because I write, and so that's pure action, right? I type letters, I type words, I type phrases, I type sentences, I type paragraphs, I type chapters, I write books, and then people and then I talk about the books, and people read the books, and the reason that they can understand the books is because we're a lot the same. You know, like, there's a lot of things that have to be the same about you and me before I can write a book that you can read. And I have to be able to take them for granted. And so, the reason I'm telling you that is because there's an important relationship between my hierarchy of values and your hierarchy of values if we're going to be able to communicate and if we're going to be able to occupy the same place at the same time. You know, so if I'm writing a book like 12 Rules for Life and it has a discussion about what constitutes the good in it, then I have to start with the presupposition that we share some fundamental intuition about what constitutes the good or my words will fall on deaf ears. Okay, and it's partly because, <clears throat> and, and, and this, is, this is maybe the relationship between the social world and the psychological world that I wanted to talk about. As I build up my hierarchy of skill and ability, perception and emotional regulation, you know, from slicing carrots upwards, you know, I'm a, I'm a good cook, I'm a good parent, maybe I'm a good man, maybe I'm a good person, you know. And all of those cover a broader and broader range of abstractions and abilities. There has to be a relationship between that and what other people think. You know, because, look, if you're, it's, your kid, you teach your kid to set the table. And then he goes to someone else's house and sets the table and he gets a swat. It's like, well, what's the consequence of that? Well, the consequence of that is that the kid is going to be unhappy. 
Well, why? Well, it's because the kid did a lot of work building up all those separate skills to undertake that complex activity. And it really is a complex activity. You don't have a robot at home that sets the table. You know, you have a cell phone and it's smart, but it can't set the damn table. It's complicated to do that sort of thing. And so your kid had built this complicated neurological structure as a consequence of reward, primarily, because reward helps build neurological structures. He built this whole structure, and now what he's hoping is that all the work that went into building that structure is something that other people will appreciate as well. So that, that's where you need the isomorphism between the intrapsychic structure, the psychological structure, and the social structure, which is why we have to have a shared social reality. This is partly why I think the postmodernists went off the rails so badly with their insistence that the world was only language. It's like, it is in some sense very important that you construe the world the same way I do, even though there's a very wide range of ways of construing the world. We come to some negotiated agreement about what's good and what isn't. So that when I do things that I think are good, you also think they're good. So that I get rewarded for my good behavior and I get, let's say, punished for my bad behavior. Because that's often a relief as well, by the way. And so we have to have our own internal structure of values that we're pursuing. Because otherwise we don't have any meaning in our life and that's no damn good. And then it has to be nested inside a shared structure of values that's similar. So that when we act out what we have learned to be good, we're treated by the world as if that's good. And then we have peace. That's the definition of, that's the definition of a functioning political system. We've, 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 we've organized a moral game, a very complex one, and then we master it through reciprocal interaction with one another, we internalize it so that it regulates our emotions, then we act it out in the world, and if there's a concordance between the way we act it out and the way the world responds, then we're okay. Because there's nothing more disturbing to you than to act out a high order moral good. Let's say you're working really hard at your job, for example, and you're hoping for a promotion, and let's say you deserve a promotion by all reasonable standards, and then you don't get one. You know, it's, it's taken, it's given to, I don't know, it's given to the boss's mistress or some damn thing. Or, you know, it, it, it's, it's given to someone who doesn't deserve it by the canonical rules of the moral game. And all it does is devastate you. And the reason that it devastates you is because it disrupts the relationship between the internal moral hierarchy that you've built and the collective hierarchy. And everything you have is staked on maintaining that isomorphism. You know, and it's the same even in... In, 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 in inter intimate relationships, you know, if you do something good for your, your wife or your husband, you know, you go out of the way maybe to make a nice meal, and they come home and they punish you arbitrarily for some tiny fault, maybe with the dinner, it's very disheartening. And the reason is it, it, it violates your faith, first of all, in your own intrapsychic hierarchy, second, in the structure of the social hierarchy, and third, in the match between them, and it's the match between them that's really important. We do not like mismatch between what we expect, especially in terms of reward, especially when we've really worked at it, and, and what we're delivered, right? And so that, that's partly how we, it's partly a complicated explanation of how we regulate our emotions. You know, we regulate them by aiming, that's important. We, we regulate them by walking the straight and narrow path, but then we also regulate them by being fortunate enough to be in a situation where if we walk the straight and narrow path properly, then other people respond positively to us. And then you have this lovely harmony, and, and it's the right way of thinking about it. It's a musical way of thinking about it. There's you composed of this very unbelievably complex, nested set of patterns, beautiful patterns that you spent forever working on. And then they're nested inside a social structure that's also patterned in the same way. And those are working harmoniously together like a dance. And that's perfect. It's, 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 the, it's the meeting of the individual with society. And it's the, it's the secret to harmonious emotional regulation and, and more, and to cooperation and, and to a proper competition and to, and, to, and to movement forward practically in the world. All of that. And so, okay, well, and I'll, I'll close with just a description of what a hierarchy might look like um, and, and a brief description of, of how it is that you calculate when you make a major mistake. So